you getting a statue? You seen it yet? I haven't. You haven't seen it at all yet? No, I, I, I've, I've seen drawings of it. I haven't seen the actual statue yet. Great. <laughs> You've only seen drawings of it, and I hope it's not life-size. There's going to be a bronze shortage if they use it all. <laughs> Are you, You're a Marvel fan then, I'm guessing? Uh, Superman. Superman. Marvel. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I like growing up as a, a medium juvenile delinquent, always on punishment. At least had the opportunity to watch TV and just see superheroes and get entrenched inside the stories that they were telling. Superman was always one. Uh, Six Million Dollar Man was another one. I uh, always wanted to be be him. Uh, Hulk was another one. I got in trouble for being a Hulk one time. <laughs> one yeah. time we saw a car that we thought was abandoned, but it wasn't. It was just stolen. It was just sitting there. So me and my friend, I, I play the Hulk, and I'm, I ripped off the mirrors. I just ripped off the doors. I ripped off everything. I got, I got uh, in uh, really big trouble for that one. How did they know it was you that did all the damage instead of the person who stole the car? Because everybody was out there. Oh, everybody's me, out. And I was going, the Hulk, and I took a brick and bust some windows. And, and then when the guy found his car, I was like, who did this? I was like, Shaquille O'Neal, he did it. And he came right to my house. You're like, but some other guy, he scratched up your lock really yeah. good when he stole the car. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so Marvel and uh, and Superman appeal to you. It seems weird punishment to put you in a place where you can watch TV and read comics and hang out and watch Six Million Dollar Man. Well, you you accomplish that goal. You got a lot more than Six Million Dollars out of it. It actually uh, changed my life. You know, it helped me. It helped me put down on paper what I wanted to become. So, just say I'm flicking the channels and I see LL Cool J. I'm gonna be a rapper. Say I flick the channel again, I see a guy doing a great sitcom. I want to be an actor. Then, of course, I'm a sports guy. I want to be Frank O'Harris, the Immaculate Conception. I want to be Reggie Jackson, hit a home run. So it, 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 it enabled me to put down on paper all these things I wanted to be. And then my father taught me the way and said, okay, you want to be all these things? This is how you do it? Go out and get it done. And uh, I've, I've accomplished everything that I, I set my mind to. So wait, you wrote down all your goals when you yes, were younger? Yes. My father made me write from A to Z what I wanted to be. So A was a basketball player. B was a basketball player. I actually got in trouble for that. You just put <laughs> basketball player for all the five, yeah, all 26. No, no. And then C was a cop. And then D was a detective. E was an entrepreneur. And, you know, F was a, a fireman. So like I just did like a, you know, a whole bunch of things that I thought I wanted to do. And you've gone through and, and tried to knock all that stuff off the bucket list? Yes. Because I made a, a, a list of, of things that you, you were do, you're doing before, but I figured I would ask now because it seems like there's a lot of things that you've done. I mean, why why now law enforcement? What's going on there? Why that? Well, I uh, two guys that are on my panel, what I mean by my panel, my panel is, 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 is a group of five men and women, consists of five uh, total of five, but but men and women. Two of the guys that are on my panel are, are my uncles from my law enforcement. My panel consists of Lucille O'Neill, Mike Paris, Jerome Crawford, Dale Brown, and Perry Rogers. That's my panel. They're the, they're the only ones that can call me and check me, and I know not to say anything back. Because <laughs> okay. I know they love me and they care for me. And, you know, when you respect somebody, see, a lot of people in my position think they know it all. They, they don't yeah. have anybody they can respect. I have a panel. It's like me being the president, but I answer to Congress. So that's my panel. But two guys on the panel are my uncles and they're law enforcement officers. So I said to myself one day, and you know, th this was on my list as a, as, as a youngster. I said, one day I want to, want to be a cop, but I don't think I, you know, with me being Shaq, me being a cop probably wouldn't be too good, but I think I, I think I can lead a force. <laughs> I want to, I want to run for sheriff. So when I started pursuing that here in Los Angeles, like a lot of people would give me badges, and I was like, you know what? Yeah. If you give me a badge, when I go out on the street, the officer's not going to respect me. So I made them put me through two different police academies. Uh, sheriff Leroy Baca was the sheriff at the time, and he approved it, and I had to go through through two different academies, and I became a full-fledged reserve officer, level one. Uh, level three is security guard status. Level two is you have to ride with another officer. Level one, you can ride by yourself. You have full-fledged police officer duties. And uh, I studied to a level one, and I did that because when I do run for sheriff, I know I could probably get a lot of votes just from being shot. Sure. But I, I really want my, my people that's working for me to know and understand I know my laws. I know what it, you know, what you go through. I know what it takes. I want them to know and understand that. And 
And I've been a lot of places around the country with a lot of police, police officers, and it's like, you know, we really, really appreciate it. Because I appreciate them, you know. Teachers and police officers are definitely underpaid. Yeah, my mom was a teacher, yeah, so I heard all about that. Yeah, they're underpaid. Yeah, I mean, well, you're you're underpaid for a guy be taking a dollar a year, right? Yep, dollar yeah. a year. I and guess. You know what's crazy? They tax that. Of course, yeah. So you get forty six cent. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Oh my god! Because the bracket. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. What have you learned on the job that you've been able to use, or what did you learn on the team anyway? Maybe that you've been able to use as a police officer, like de escalation techniques, and get along with people, and stuff like that. Well, I always come in. I always come in at zero. A lot of times when you're dealing with people, you just listen first instead of react. Now, a lot of situations are dangerous, so you have to come in high. But you know, a lot of situations where it's just people there talking and arguing, you just try to have to just try to de-escalate the situation. You know how. The fortunate thing for me is when I show up, people just calm down automatically. <laughs> so that's a fortunate thing yeah. for me. For me, it was just about learning it, mastering it. So when I do run for sheriff, the guys know I'm not just a celebrity figure. Right. And wants a badge and a gun. So I've been, uh, let's see, I went to, uh, went to LA Academy, uh, did, did a Florida Academy, did a Phoenix Academy, getting ready to go through a Georgia Academy. Cause plan on running for sheriff in either Georgia or Florida in 2020. I had wow. a dream. I had a dream that I saw a bunch of, uh, I saw a bunch of stickers on the cars, Shaq's vision for 2020. Shaq for sheriff 2020. Nice. So you're actually going to run for office? I'm, I'm thinking in about it. Yeah, I'm really thinking about it. And what sort of policy do you think you'll put in place as the as the elected sheriff? It'll be paramilitary, <laughs> uh, martial law a, all around. No, not not I'm martial just law. Just, I hope not. Just you know, discipline. That's a friend of mine in in Clayton County, Sheriff Victor Hill. And I met him a couple months ago. He has the cleanest, most disciplined jail I've ever seen in my life. So I'm I'm definitely going to get to know him a little better, study his tactics. Because that's how I grew up, and, you know, teaches the the, the, the the young men and women that are in there, teaches them have to be responsible, teaches them honor. Uh, and, you know, he does it in a polite way. There's no, no, nothing crazy in there, but it's just so much like his floors were shining and the pods in the cells, the clothes were folded. And when he walks in, the guys stand at attention and wow. they salute. It was, it, was, it was really awesome to see. Because I've been to jails where people – you know, seven, eight guys in the cell, they're in there fighting and doing this and doing that. But his jail was very disciplined, so I'm definitely going to be studying his techniques. I think uh, I think a lot of people would definitely vote for you because of the celebrity, but it's good that you're trying to earn the same respect as the other officers. Otherwise, you end up with the same problem that, that people have now. We have a lack of author- of real authority. And what, what, what happens when people show up to, or when you show up to a call with other people there? I mean, do they just go, holy crap, a check? Or are there people who don't know who you are and they're just like, dang, at, that's at a first, big cop. Well, At first, when I was on patrol in LA, it was, it got to be, you know, got to be sort of like a, like a TV sitcom. Like I'd pull up in my suit and everybody, hey, is that, is that Shaq? And you see guys call across the street and calling on the phone. And I got promoted to detective. So a lot of time when I show up at the detective, People think it's, it's a joke or not. So what right. I started doing was, as a detective, when we go in four or five detectives, I would come in last. I let all the you know the real cops go in first, let everybody know what's going on, so everybody knows it's a serious moment, and then I would come in. Because if I come in first, people shack, hello, hey, I right. saw you at the camera. Yeah. Got to be, Where's the cameras? Got to be yes, exactly. How often do you hear comments about your height? And I assume all the time, right? All the time. And but you uh, know what? I learned at an early age not to take things so seriously. Yeah, I hear jokes. Uh, how, how's the weather up there? I hear, I hear it all. I'm glad I didn't start and with that. I'm at the point in my life now. I've I've actually been here a long time. Nothing can really hurt my feelings. I think the times we're living in, people are very sensitive. Like, like I don't know you, but I'm sure if we just have a good conversation, and again, when I'm having a conversation, we don't have to agree on everything. Yeah, but I respect you. You respect me. I guarantee. We have something in common. See, a lot of people these days, you you think a certain way, and you try to influence me to think that way. The, the world was, the world wasn't built like that. Every fingerprint is different, every DNA is different, and and everybody's opinion is different. And a lot of times, we react to people's opinions without listening. True story. It's a guy, fashion guy, dresses kind of nice. His name is Jimmy Goldstein. I think is his name. He told me one day during the game, "I hate you." What? Oh, that's rude. Yeah, no, he said, I hate you. So I'm boom, 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 boom. 
But I would see him at all the parties with us. Boom, boom, boom. So I finally I said, he's a skip, he's a small guy. So usually when a guy says, I hate you, I went, okay, well, I hate you too. Let's fight about it. But <laughs> he's a real skinny guy. So I asked him, I said, why do you hate me? He said, because you're so dominant, it's unfair. I want to see you lose. So rather than reacting to what he said, by me having a conversation with him, I understood that. And I and, and I can understand you're a fan, you want your team to win, but you're going up against this guy Shaq that's throwing people around. I can understand the hatred. So that was a valuable lesson for me because, like, when people say something, my reaction button is off. My intelligent button is on. Okay, what did you say? What do you mean? And I analyze it, and I analyze it in a nice way before I react. How do you do that, especially when you – did you do that when you were 22, 23 years no, old? No, no. When I was 22, 23, I tried to answer everybody's criticism. And I realized that it's more than a full-time job. It becomes stressful. You start getting anxiety. And then I realized that you can't please everyone. Yeah. And, you know, this is the same thing I tell my children now. So you see your hands? Five fingers on your hand. Try to impress the five most important people in your life. That's my panel. So as long as they're happy, I'm happy. Like whenever I start doing something crazy, one, two, three, four, five will let me know, and then I have to switch it back up. How did you pick the panel? I mean, one is your mother. One's my mother. Two of my uncles. They always kept me out of trouble. Yeah. And Perry is my uh, uh, agent, business manager. Been been that for a long time. And Perry is brutally honest. He's not one of those KYA type agents. I don't know if I can say kiss your ass on your podcast. Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure. but he's not one of those agents. So, like, he'll tell you, like, what you said last night was uncalled for, boom, boom, boom. He's very, very intelligent. He's a lawyer. You know, lawyers think very different. So, you know, he, you know, he wants the best for me, and it's something that I appreciate and respect. Crazy thing about Perry, we're, we're similar ages. So, like, he's probably the youngest guy on the panel. He's around my age, but very intelligent, come from very intelligent family. Father was a brilliant businessman. Mother was a brilliant businesswoman. So, uh, you know, when you respect people, you listen to them, especially people that, that help you get to where you are. How did you pick, when did you pick that panel, I should say? Because you, did you pick it before your career started no, and everything? Never, never. No, never, I had to go through a lot of trials and tribulations before I figured all this stuff out. And, you know, experience is the best teacher. And, you know, I have my basic core principles, uh, stay true to myself, have fun, uh, never, never take advantage of people, never disrespect people. And then as I started getting older, I started adding more, you know, business, you know, practical things inside that formula. And then I realized a, a movie that changed my life was The Fan, Robert De Niro and Wesley Snipes. So Wesley, uh, Robert De Niro asked Wesley, he said, hi, you're a great player. You do this, you do that, boom, 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 boom. And uh, Wesley Snipes said, I don't care. So I had to stop caring, not caring to the sense to where it would, you know, affect my profession, but just stop caring about what people say. Once I started doing that, psh, blossomed. Nice. So you you actually went through a phase where you just went, I cared about it everything. doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah like, I care like, about everything. Like Shaq, the only thing Shaq can do is dunk. He can't shoot jumpers. So then the next game I go, Three for twenty-five, trying to shoot jumpers. Oh man! <laughs> yes. yeah. So you're just always challenging yes. yourself to figure o out something. Always, always. And you've been successful for a long time. How come you didn't fall into those same traps that a lot of other athletes did? Is it the panel? Is that was that the early panel, enough? And before the panel, a lot of children don't do this today. But when I see tragic stories, I don't want to go that route. One tragic story: when Lynn Bias passed away from using cocaine. My father came in the house furious. Furious. If you ever do this, I'll kill you. You ain't going to have time to overdose. I'll kill you. <laughs> so I always say, you know what? No drugs for me. Uh, one time, true story, in Germany, West Germany, friends. This is around, you know, when you're a teenager and you get to go to parties. And, sure. You know, the parents are sleeping when you come home. All the friends were into beer drinking. Sure. They just drink some beer. So one night. Snowstorm, because I lived in Wild Flick and the schools in Fulda, so it was about a 50 minute ride. So one time we go to the dance and, you know, the guys had a beer and, you know, one of the guys had his license. Dad was out of town. He took his car. He's like, hey, let's ride home. And the guys was drinking. And I was like, you know what? Uh, no, you know, I heard a lot of stories about what happened and tragic ending. They died. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. So that could have been yeah, you exactly. real easy. Yeah. It could have been me. So like a lot of, 
a lot of things I've I've seen before they happen, and I don't want to go down that that rope. Uh, my father used to always come in and say, "All right, you had thirty points, but what you gonna do when you hurt your knee?" Because it's a astonishing uh, percentage of, of of athletes that after they're done playing, they have nothing, and we didn't want to be part of that statistic. Yeah, sixty percent are broke. Yeah. I think within five years of retirement or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's really sad. I mean, you don't have that problem. You're still working, probably because you got six kids. You got to work. <laughs> you yeah, can't ever work. retire. Yeah, definitely got to work. How did you deal with not only becoming the most valuable player or visible player in the league, but also a celebrity at the same time? I mean, it, a lot of guys are going through the same visibility role, but you had all I'm, kinds of things going on. How how come it didn't get out of control? I think it just never got out of control because even to this day, I don't consider myself a celebrity. My story is like a Rocky story. Guy from the neighborhood that's loved and respected in the neighborhood had an opportunity to do something, you know, do something for a community or do something for a state or do something for a nation. That's my story. My story is not superstar, entourage, 50 agents, 100 diamond chains. That's My story is a regular guy. See me, I'm, I'm in the car by myself today. I'm in L.A. by myself. I go to a lot of cities. I go to countries by myself. I don't consider myself a superstar. And when people come up to me, especially children, I always got to take care of children. I just try to accommodate them. Unless I'm eating. When I'm, I'm in the middle of the meal, I'd rather not be interrupted. But if I'm out and I see a little baby and they want my autograph, I of course, I always oblige them. But I think what's made me relevant and and you know, in all these situations, is that I don't consider myself a superstar. I'm just a regular guy from the neighborhood that did something astonishing. I won three champions in LA, one in Miami. You know, he was a guy. He was always in trouble. He was a juvenile delinquent. We knew he could be somebody. That's more of my story. That's yeah, that's great. Especially if you're not thinking of yourself as right. somebody extra special all the yeah, time. No, I don't do that. It manages the expectations pretty well, I think, too. And you've always approached the even basketball as a business. And so was your panel advising you on that? And I'm sticking with the panel thing because I think it's such a great idea. And most people are not doing this. Clearly, the athletes that are going broke are not doing this. When I first came in, I was upset before I came in because I got an F in marketing. Marketing teacher at LSU said, give me something, product, something that you can see sold in the future. Not now, 2000, 2001, all that. So you know me, I came with Shaq hats, <laughs> Shaq shoes, Shaq shirts, and he embarrassed me in class. He said, oh, I see you put a lot of originality in this and gave me an F in front of everybody. And I asked him, so what would you do? He said, if you look at if you look at the, the, the nature of a marketing and NBA, big guys never sell. I was like, you know what? Don't sell. So when I first got in, you know, you hear a lot of stories that the, the, the number one pick and name whatever he wants so when i first got in i was like you know let me let me try this theory i want this i want this i want to be able to have creative control over all my commercials so i'm not doing it so my agent at the time he got it done so every commercial that we shot uh my my thought process is okay this is how i want people to see me this is the message i want to send and at the end of all these commercials i want to i want to add a fun aspect to it and I derived at that mentality because I'm looking at all the commercials. I'm like, big guys don't sell. My favorite commercial was the Spuds McKenzie commercials. He never talked. Yeah. Dog never said anything. But what, 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 why did people, why did this dog have shirts, mugs, hats, everything, book bags? Because he always added a fun element in his commercial. So I was like, you know what? Every commercial I'm doing has got to have a fun element in it. Product is a product, but after that, I'm going to give them like this in a Buick yeah. or a man up or, you know, something. How are you going to teach your kids some of the same values that you had with your panel growing up? I mean, do your kids have panels and stuff like that? They don't have panels. I try to I try to do uh, lead by example. Uh, I try to teach them the same life lessons that I was taught. Yesterday, we were at the mall. My son said, uh, I want to get some Jordans. I said, well, you're going to have to donate 10 pair of your old shoes. I already did that. I said, well, you need to pr prove it to me. And he actually did. Uh, him and my other son, they went down to the Goodwill and they just donated their stuff. And we used to do that as a youngster. Like my father, we used to go to Goodwill and pick up some stuff and take it to all the, you know, the other troop families that were lesser fortunate. Uh, my father, 
I always love homeless people. I love homeless people. Uh, my my grandmother was a nurse, so my mother and I started a foundation. We've we've sent over a hundred nurses to college, four year uh, scholarships. So I just try to lead by example, and I don't put pressure on them. Like I got a couple sons that play ball. We don't even talk basketball. It's not important to me. What's important to me that that they that they build what I started. Uh, one of my favorite nepotism stories is is Nick and Mickey Arison. So an article comes out in the paper that uh, uh, Nick Arison's grandmother left them hundred two hundred men. This guy's nineteen went uh, went to college at Duke wow. and graduated. So he comes back and joined the team. It's a guy in there worth two hundred million dollars cleaning up the locker room. And I'm looking, I'm like, this kid's worth two. He should be up hanging out with his dad because yeah. here, that's what you see. Right, you sure. You see a lot of kids that hanging out with dad and dad does everything for him. But he had a kid worth $200 million. This document, his grandmother left him $150 million plus 20% of the team. Wow. He's down in the locker room cleaning up. Next year, you see him in marketing. And then you see him doing, you see him outside, boom, 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 handing out flyers. And then finally, about five, six years, his father now, after he went to school and graduated and learned the business from the bottom, then his father said, okay, boom. And I think he made him vice president. That That's one of my favorite nepotism stories. And I have to do the same thing, you know, rather than just give it to him. Like I tell my kids all the time, you get no degrees, then you get none of my cheese. <laughs> that's my slogan around my house. So no they're degrees, all, no cheese. They're all looking forward to college yeah, then. Yeah, yeah they got to be. <laughs> You mentioned shoes earlier. You got the biggest pair of Tom shoes that I've ever seen. And I thought, all right, where do you get shoes that big? You have to have things custom made. I seen, I fell in love with Tom about three years ago. I see people wearing them like, what is that? And his story is incredible. You buy, you buy a pair, we'll donate a pair. Love that story. So every person that I, uh, how can I get the Tom? They give me a number. Didn't work. Give me a number. Didn't work. So finally, about two years later, I seen the the owner of Tom's, him and his wife. We met in Westwood, and I said, uh, "Listen, I love your product. How can I get a pair?" He's like, "Shaq, be honest with you, we don't have the twenty two mold. I'm like, I, I can't, I can't slow production down to make one shoe." And I said, "Well, what, what's a what's a good production day?" He said, "About a thousand pair." I said, "Well, make me a thousand pair then." So. I uh, got a thousand pair that I ordered. I'm, I'm only into my first hundred, and uh, we're we're in discussions. We want to go to like one of these third world countries and and you know hand out some shoes. So and find people with yes. huge feet who need no, shoes. No, not huge feet, just whoever. Kids, oh, okay, old gotcha. ladies, babies, yeah, whoever. Yeah, Tom's is the right company to do that with. Yes, that's for are. sure. It, it sounds like uh, in the past you've been competitive with pretty much everything, not just basketball. I read an article online, I think it might have been on Reddit, so articles using it loosely, but you had the biggest bed in the world, and then someone challenged you and said, no, I think my bed's bigger, so you doubled the size of your bed? Yes, that's true. I'm, I'm very, very competitive. You know, it's all about having fun. Yeah. It's all about having fun. I'm, I'm, I'm the doctor, the ambassador, the emperor of fun. Nobody has more fun than me. And our fun is genuine. It's not I've been I've been a class clown since elementary school. You know, I, the the, the uh, fun that I'm having now, I used to get in trouble for as yeah, a youngster. Sure. But it's called having a sense of humor. I don't take myself too seriously, and you know, it's just you know, it's just interacting with people. And some guy he tried to make a bed, and then I just had to double my bed, and I have more space. So if I have to make my whole room a bed, yeah. I will. That's why they call it a bedroom, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So you're good. You've had some beefs in the past from that competitive spirit. When there's a conflict on a team, how do you address that and it's then move towards beefs. the goal? It's never beefs. Uh, my whole concept was it could only be one leader. And you can't be a good leader if your followers don't trust and respect you, right? So I always had to make sure I was doing everything right before I challenged anybody. And then a lot of times, like for example, the Kobe situation, I knew Kobe could take it. And I knew that if you upset him, he 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 he's he's sort of like me. You know, he'll, he'll try to prove you wrong. And you know, crazy thing about it is, people always say, "Oh, well, don't you wish you and Kobe could have worked out?" We did work out. We won three out of four. Yeah. Like I don't understand. Like I don't understand your question. It'd be a better story if we played together for eight years and have no championships. Would you like that story better? No, I, wouldn't like that story. <laughs> I don't think yeah, so. It'd be a better story. But the key word is respect. Like me and you could have a respectful disagreement. I'm not going to beat you up. Like, I was never going to beat him up. I'm like, 
do this, do that. No, you do do that. And we have a conversation and then you just move on. Do you regret at all hazing Yao Ming so hard and stuff like that? I wasn't hazing him. You know, I, I kind of got in trouble for doing something one time, but I wasn't making fun of him. As a youngster, that's what we saw. Sure. We saw. Right. That, that, so, the Chinese, yeah, the Mandarin so Chinese, yeah. I was just trying to just trying to be cute and cool, and, and somebody took it. and You're and racist was, now. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, what are, you, what are you talking like? But like, yeah. there's, there's, no, there's not a racist bone in my body. He didn't seem to mind. Everybody yeah, else cared, but, but except for him. But you know what? Where I'm from. Every Saturday we watch Chinese dinner, and that's it, we're, and, and, and they making fun. It's actually showing respect. <laughs> you want to fuck like that? The kung fu movies. That's why. I, that's why I came up with the name Shaq Fu. I used to be in the house practicing that stuff, and like I would get a white towel, act like I had a white beard. I love Chinese people, so <laughs> you know sometimes you have to be careful. Uh, and you know I, I understand like you know some people are very very sensitive, and you just have to be careful. With how you word things sometimes. You mentioned that you're the, you could not get in Hakeem's head. Why do you think that is? Why could you not get I in his head? I think I showed him too much respect. We had the same agent at one time, and he was just a nice guy. I didn't want to, and I didn't want to hurt my friend. Gotcha. And he kind of set me up because during the regular season, I was having my way with him. So when we got to the finals that year in Orlando, I was real arrogant. We had 10 days off. We was doing things all wrong. We were flying to Atlanta, partying, flying it like it was it was out of control. We had a mini parade and cuz we thought he was going to win cuz I thought I was going to win it. And then he just then he just turned that switch on me and I couldn't couldn't get him to turn it off. So, it seems like he didn't have any Hakeem Fu or anything. You were just nicer to him. Yeah, I was just nice way. to him like usually a guy like that I would I would uh first play the game, try to commit an offensive foul. That was my thing. Like, I'd, I'd take three steps to the middle and swing the elbow around. If your face is there, you get hit. Three things going to happen. I'm going to either score, I'm going to either miss, or the ref going to call an offensive foul every time. So the first play of the game, I'm, I'm letting you know that I'm coming with nothing but force. So if your face is in the way, it's not my problem. So, But I didn't do that with him. With him, I was real finesse and trying to be cool and cute and, and costly. But also taught me a valuable lesson that – uh uh, I said to myself, if I, if I ever make it back to the finals again, I'm going to throw a dominant performance so dominant it's a, it'll guarantee a win. And I think that's why I got three finals MVPs because I didn't want to have that feeling of, of letting everybody down, the panel, the family, the kids, the city. Because when you win, you get the praise. But when you lose, you get the finger. And I understand that and I respect that and I accept that. How do you turn up the heat and get more – physically aggressive on the court or more aggressive in the game without getting angry or losing your losing your shit a little bit. Because NBA stands for nothing but actors. In real life, I'm a nice guy. Yeah. I'm I'm Terminator body with a Bambi heart. <laughs> That's what I am. So on the court, this is my persona. I'm Shaq. Not only that, I'm trying to win. 17,000 fans in here relying on me. I got kids relying on me. I got millions of fans relying on me. I got kids that want to be like me. I'm going to do the same thing for them that Dr. J did for me. Dr. J changed my life. Dr. J was the guy that said, okay, now I know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, I had some good grades, and my father took me to a game. We're way up in uh, Madison Square Garden, probably the top row. Boring game. Dr. J goes baseline, throw it down. The whole arena stands out. It actually scared me because I thought something was happening. And then I look at my dad's like, I know what I want to be when I grow up, Dad. I want to be down there. He's like, well, this is what you got to do, son. And so I, I want to be I want to be that that person to a kid that's you know trying to do something with his life now. So you and your dad outlined a plan to get all the way to the NBA. Yes, we did. How did that look back then? I mean, it seems like a lot of people do that now, but there's too many there's too much white space where you kind of don't really know what goes in between. He taught me how to play the right way. Taught me how to work hard told me to expect not being as good as I wanted to be from the early, but that's okay to keep working. Taught me to take criticism and use it as motivation and taught me to compete at a high level. Like I've, I've won on every level except college. The, uh, Little League, AAU, uh, Olympics, Junior Olympics, won on every level except college. So as a youngster, when I used to play and win, he would let me celebrate the trophy one day. I come home after school and be gone. And he was the type you never asked him where's the trophy at. So I, I finally asked him 
when I got older, and he said, I did it because I never want you to be satisfied. I want you to always want more as a player. So even as a youngster, when I was a player and I wasn't that good, that wasn't stopping me because I knew that because of my work ethic, I was going to be somebody. And with him being a drill sergeant, I would have to get up at 5.30 with him and his troops, and his troops would go through the course first, and I'd be right behind him. He was literally a drill sergeant. Yes. And he made you get up early with all the troops and go work out? And I had to uh, fold the bed, and he'd drop a quarter on it, and the, the pillows had to be creased, all that stuff. If not, he'd wow. mess it up, and I'd have to do it again. He'd be like, you only got five minutes. If you don't get it done in five minutes, you're going to be on that track double time. Move it, move it. Yeah, best thing that happened to him. Your dad was pretty good at balancing being a nurturing, caring father with being a real hard ass from the sound of it. No, he was hard ass 70% of the time. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, military life, uh, family, marriage. He was really hard ass. But he taught me, don't listen to how I say it. Listen to what I say. Because when you're a drill sergeant, you got to be like this at all times. So he was like that all the time. But he could be really nice. Like he would be like, what's up, Perry? How you doing? Like he'd be yelling, but he'd be talking. So that was just who he was. And uh, again, you know, he, he, he told me, he said, don't listen to how I say it. Just listen to what I say. And so, like, even with him yelling all the time, it wasn't a, a real yell. It was just, it was just how he was. What balance do you take with your own kids between being tough on them and being nurturing when, when appropriate? I, I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. I have six awesome children. They know and understand. I have, I have face discipline with them. Like, all, all, all I gotta do is make a face, and they know. <laughs> And the face sometimes get me in trouble with the girls because they'll just start shedding tears immediately. So I have to limit, I have to loosen up the face muscles with the girl. But the guys, I just like, are you, really? Say it again. I dare you. Like, but I've never had to spank them or never do anything. So that's uh, good for me. Yeah. So you you they know what might be coming just from the look, and that's enough yeah, they, usually. Yeah, they know. I think most parents probably have that. Yeah. If you don't have face discipline, yeah, you gotta you got problems. Yeah, all yeah. I gotta do is just look at them. How do you separate the game and fame from your personal life and not let one interfere with the other? Because you're really it good is. at that. It is what it is. What you see is what you get. A lot of people like to use the word role model. To me, is you're playing a role, right? I'm a real model. What you see is what you get. You know, I don't want to be one of those guys that acts a certain way when the cameras are on, when the marketing team is around, and then get behind closed doors and do that because that's how one day you get caught and people right. realize that you're a fraud and it'll be all over. It's happened. So I try to keep it real but in a respectful manner. With me, what you see is what you get. I'm a funny guy in real life. I talk to people in real life. I love kids in real life. I love rims and, you know, I love hanging out. This is what I do. I'm also – very professional. I'm also educated. I speak the language, and I think that's why I'm running for sheriff. I, th I think I'll, I'll do a good job because I speak all types of languages. I can go on the corner and, what up, bro? Boom, 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 boom. I could throw on a three-piece suit and have a conversation with Warren Buffett, and boom, I can go. I speak all those languages, but I just try to, I just try to be myself. Like I don't, I, I can't, I can't put on a facade just for this. Yeah. Because that will catch up with you eventually. I think a lot of people in your position do put on that facade. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. What do you think is the difference between the confidence to just keep it real, just be yourself all the time, and the cockiness that a lot of these other guys exhibit all the time? I can't speak for anybody else, but, you know, I'm, I'm in a position in my life. It's, it's all about having fun. Like, I hate seeing people talk about how much money they got. Who cares? You know, you know what I love? I live in I live in a neighborhood and l listen to me closely now. I live in a neighborhood in Orlando. My house is seventy thousand square feet. I'm not bragging. Seventy thousand square feet. Seventy thousand square feet. It's not the best house in the neighborhood. It's a guy that has one for ninety. And guess what? I don't know who he is or what he does. I've been I've been trying for years to they're just like, who is this guy? It's another house down at the fifty thousand. It's one forty like it's one that has a yacht in the back, like those are people I really respect because they just do their work and they just come home. They're not they're not on Instagram. Look, I'm living at the track. I got a yacht. Like I hate people like that. I, I would never do that. I mean, like I every now and then I say, okay, I, I got this just to know that. But I I don't like people like that. Yeah, you talk more about icy hot than your car collection. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you actually, I looked at your car collection online and I I noticed you have a smart car. 
And I got, I got. That was ask, a long time ago. Okay, because I was thinking. I bought it as a bet. <laughs> what was the bet? I bet you bet, can't fit in this smart car, or I bet you can't get out. I bet me thirty thousand to my favorite charity that I couldn't fit in the smart car. So I bought the car, got in the car, and then I gave the car to his daughter. Really? Yeah. So you didn't seat mod the car? No, and, no. So you can re- no. you really pulled that seat all the way back and just all sat in that smart car? Yeah, my but, knees were touching, touching the steering wheel a little bit, but I fit. Now, like, you know, even with the Buick, people are like, oh, you adjust the seat. The people at Buick wouldn't allow us to adjust the seat. So I, really? I, I actually really fit. I uh, I got tired of being asked, do I fit in the Buick so much? I went out and bought a Buick. And one time I, I was speeding on the highway. I apologized to all the police officers. And the cop stopped me. And he comes up to the window, license registration. And he sees me, and you should see the joy in his face. And he says, oh, shit, you really do fit in the Buick. <laughs> Go. Be careful. And it was, and it was a great story. That is that is funny. Yeah, because you, I, I would imagine, like, the Ferraris, you got to mod the seats. Yes. All these little cars, you got to mod the seats. Yep. But uh, what what other things do you have to have custom made? Shoes, beds, car seats occasionally. I'm, I'm curious. A lot of people ask me to ask it's, you that. It's close. Uh, but... Like I'm a, I'm a t-shirt, jeans, Tom's type of guy. You know, I still got my Shaq shoes that, that I wear every day. But just a, I'm just a normal, basic guy these days. So <clears throat> I will, I will buy in bulk because I don't like shopping. So like these jeans I have on today, I guarantee I got forty pairs of of each color. And they're just in my house, so I don't want to be able to like three years from now go go buy a jeans. I want to have like two hundred, three hundred pair of jeans in uh, each house. Wow. So you just, and do you buy the clothes yourself or you have somebody who's like, hey, get him, he likes these, get a hundred more? I'm a regular guy. I do stuff myself. I go to Walmart by myself. I go to CVS by myself. I go to Waffle House. I go to Krispy Kreme all by myself. You own, Do you own a Krispy Kreme? I feel like yes. you, yeah. Yes. Yeah. In Atlanta. A and legendary you, spot in Atlanta. You own a lot of different franchise businesses and things like that. How do you decide what to invest in? I mean, who do you even trust to advise you in that kind of thing? Well, first I trust my panel, of course, sure. and then myself. Like, for example, if I don't like this water and you being the CEO of this company, there's no amount of money you can offer me to, to drink this. And I, and then I'll tell my panel, okay, if they're interested, I'm sure somebody else be interested. This is what I like to drink. That's the story I tell everybody. After we won a championship, Wheaties contacted us. But as a youngster, I, I've seen the great Wheaties commercials, but... We couldn't afford Wheaties. For us, it was Frota Frakes, Fruit Loops, Diggum Smacks. So Wheaties contacted us and said, hey, want you to be on the cover? And I told my agent, I said, I can't do it. He said, what do you mean you can't do a breakfast champion? I said, I never ate Wheaties, and I'm not going to try it right now. Like, my, like if I'm eating cereal, it's going to be Frota Flakes 1, Fruity Pebbles, and then Diggum Smacks. So second championship, Wheaties come back again. I'm like, can't do it, bro. Third championship, like, ah, can't do it. And then the fourth championship, I think they did a deal with the NBA, and D-Wade and myself was on it. And then finally my dream came true. About three years ago, Perry came to me and said, I got some good news, got some bad news. I said, okay, what's the bad news? He said, Frosted Flakes, still not interested. Because I, cause I, cause I actually told him, I said, call Frosted Flakes sure. and tell him I'll be on the cover with Tony for free. You ain't even got to pay me. They didn't buy it. So he said, Frosted Flakes, not in, 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 uh, they're not interested. But Fruity Pebbles is. And he said, they want to put you on 13 million boxes. And I said, let me think about it. Hell yeah. <laughs> so I was on the cover of 13 million boxes of, of Fruity Pebbles, which, which, which was awesome. Because growing up, that's what I ate. And in college, I really used Icy Hot, and it really worked. And I was like, this stuff really works. So when they approached it, I was like, you know what? I know about this product firsthand. Let's do it. So... You know, I, I have to be comfortable with the product. Uh, and then, like, if I'm not comfortable with the product, it has to be something new and, and innovative. Like, I'm really into technology. So, like, we meet with a lot of, a lot of people that try to show off stuff. And I'm a geek. A geek, a geek saved, saved my high school career. Really? I had a 69.2 in government class. And like it was, a D minus or yeah, something D-. like that. D minus. And it was, and it was around playoff time, and you know, teacher. I, mean, I wasn't a wasn't a bad student. I just wasn't getting it. And the teacher's like, you know what? I'm gonna give you I'm, I'm gonna give you a chance to retake this test because we were like 33 and all at the time. Like she's like, I'm not gonna pass you just because you're athlete, but you work hard. I respect your work. You're not a troublemaker, class. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to retake this test. You got to study with McDougal. 
McDougal was a geek in <laughs> yeah, school. Sure. That everybody used to bully, and I used to just stick up for him. Like they'd be messing with him because he was a, he was a smart kid. He had the computer back in the day where you had to press spacebar, ESC, and delete, and he had the big. You know, he had that computer back in the day. Like and everybody, everybody used to mess with him, and I was the only one be like, "Yo, man, leave him alone. Just leave him alone." So he was my tutor, and he was the coolest guy ever. And he broke it down. So the way he broke it down, I made a B on the test. Boom, won the state championship, and I was like, you know what? I respect geeks and how they think. I want to be a geek, and I've been a geek ever since, and I'm proud to say it. And, and if you see me in the streets, you can call me Big Geek, and it won't hurt my feelings. Nice. You ever keep in touch with McDougal? No. I wish I, I wish I, you know, crazy thing is I don't even really know his name. People just used to call him McDougal. Oh, so he could, be, that could be anybody. Yeah, I actually, I actually, I actually have to look at my yearbook and see his name, but he, he was a nice kid. And my school was nine through 12, 269 kids, 9 through 12. Dang. And my senior class was 39 students. So it was a small school. Yeah. Everybody knew over So, like, if you were an athlete and you was picking on this guy, I didn't really play that. I'm like, yo, man, leave him alone. Just, you know, like, people would be messing with him. Because he just kept to himself and didn't say anything. And But this dude had a 4.9. He was one of the smartest guys in school. Like, I could see people, like, when, when, they, when they're taking tests, I could see people looking over, what does McDougal say? Oh, yeah. See? See, so I always used to just stick up for him because I don't like people just messing with people for no reason. Were you so you were always like that? You always yeah, had a good sense of like humor. That, yeah. Always no, no. I was a bully at first. Really? Yeah, and uh, this this happened in Hinesville, Georgia. I want to say fifth grade. So previous before I got to school, my father said, "If you get suspended one more time, you already know what's going to go down when you get oh, home." Man, drill the sergeant. Paddle. Yeah, the paddle. So I'm in class, and I have a water bottle. I don't even know what I got it for, and I got some tissue. And I'm making this gigantic spit wide, and I'm just lubing it up. Boom, and it's the wettest thing ever. Oh, man. And I throw it on the chalkboard, and psh, splat. The kid, everybody, the kid's going crazy. Teacher turns around. I'm silent. So, And at this point, all the students know, don't mess with Shaq, because he will do something to you. Take your lunch, whatever, whatever. So I'm sitting there, and the teacher goes, who did that? And the guy rats me out. Go to the thing, spend the five days. So now I get to go back to class and with the little slippers that I got suspended. And I'm just sitting like, man, man, man. And finally around 2.50, we get out at 3 o'clock. I look at the kids and say, I'm getting you today. And if I'm going to get an ass whooping, you are too. So I wait about an hour and I see him sneaking behind. I get him and I just start touching him up and he starts having an epileptic season. Oh, man. Yeah. And some guy, an innocent bystander, came, put a pencil in his mouth. Uh, so the cops came to the house, and they knew my father. And the guy's family didn't want to press charges. But what my father did, he allowed the MPs to take me to jail. They said, this is what would have happened to you to kill this kid. Yeah. Man. And they put me through the whole process, charging me, handcuffing me, put me in a cell, boom, 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 boom. It was sort of like... It was sort of like an uncut, uh, gone straight. Like, you yeah, scared straight, yeah. yeah. It like, but it was uncut because this was like a military prison. These guys in there, they were tough. And after that day, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, I'm done with that. I mean, because it would have been a whole different – if that kid would have passed away, it would have been a yeah. whole different story. You didn't know that that was going to happen. No, I was, I was just – you know, I was yeah. just trying to – I was just trying to uh, show off for no reason. Where do you think you'd be today if you didn't become a basketball player? Be a cop? Yeah. So you you come full circle now. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember asking my father that. He said, you would be a somebody. Doesn't matter. Like, you know, I don't I don't brag to the fact that I did this and I did that because we're all human beings, all put on this earth. We all put our, all males and females put their clothes on the same way. We're all the same people. Some people just have different circumstances. So I try not to flash my circumstances in people's face. The unfortunate thing is they know all my circumstances anyway, sure. so I don't, yeah. I don't have to put it in their face. Is it is it strange to you not being able to have like a private life that people will just leave you the hell alone if you wanted it? I mean, I don't I don't look at it like that. I mean, if I, if, if I want to be unseen, I know how to get away. Like my go-to place to get away is Turks and Caicos in the Bahama. Rent me a little boat and just look at the blue water and just relax. If I don't, if I'm having a bad day, I'll stay in the house. 
Let's, y'all don't want to go out and give me all the get out of my face. Like, you know, I don't want mm-hmm. to, I want that story to be out. So I know how to I know how to navigate my way through. So you manage your emotions really well, it seems like. Because you you're self aware enough to know I'm eighty I'm twenty. I'm eighty percent humorous, twenty percent serious. And I don't really have to get serious a lot. You know, I'm, it's good that, you know, three people on my panel handle ninety percent of my business affairs. Which is a good thing to have. Yeah. They're, they are the left side of my brain. So they, I let them do all the intelligent thinking and we have conversations and then I'll help them make a decision at the end, which is good. Because I think if I had to do all this stuff by myself, I'd probably go crazy. So nice to have, nice to have teammates around you to help you win uh, championships. Were you always the biggest kid yes. in your class growing up? I was yeah. always the biggest kid and. After I became a bully, I was like, how can I get these people to like me and respect me? Bam, I'm going to be silly. I'm a funny guy. I watch Good Times, Sam and Son, Brady <laughs> Bunch, Might. Tom and Jerry. I like to laugh. I like to make people laugh. I like to dance. This is what I'm going to do to get people to like me. And it worked. So I'm curious the social impact of people always looking up at you and commenting on your height and asking, hey, do you play basketball? Because you weren't really a basket. You weren't good at basketball when you were young because you were too big, right? When you were really young? No, I was just, that wasn't I was too big. I was uncoordinated. Yeah, that's what I meant, yeah. I didn't have the belief. And once I saw Dr. J, it's all about believing. Like a thought can just just turn up your whole your whole internal structure. It was crazy, like, because I thought I was a terrible player, so I actually was a terrible player. And then once I, I could do that. Like, it just, it, it felt, you know, it felt like a movie, like, I, I, like as soon as I said I could do that, it felt like a, just entered my body. And I just took off from there. So you just, you just kind of. I just thought about it. Thought about it and let it yeah. re- cha- reprogram, yeah. your, reprogram yourself. Because for so long, you know, with being, being 6'3", six, 6'4", six, not being able to play and people whispering, he's going to be terrible. Like, you, you hear that stuff and you see it, you start to believe it. I'm like, maybe I am terrible. You know what? Let me let me go to this local ROTC program and look at these pamphlets and see what the military life is really about. Get Eighteen to get in, boom, bam, bam, bam. I'm I might I might be in a, in the military. Then I just changed my thought process and then. Pew. What age did that happen? Fifteen. Fifteen. Wow. Yep. So you were pretty young still at that point. Yeah, I saw have... Doctor J at fourteen, and then fifteen, I was like, now it's time to go do something about it. Is your mom coming out for the statue unveiling? Yes, she is. Yeah, yeah. You still turn to her for advice from the sound of it. And she's on the panel. I mean, she even had you sort of. She's the, she's the head of the panel. And the head of the panel. She gets upset with me sometimes. Like doing this to the the uh, what you call beef. I'm not gonna say his name. I don't want to get sensitive. I was about him. to bring that up, yeah. but I won't do it. No, you can bring it up. I'm not gonna say his name. Okay. Him, but got out of hand, and when she called, she said squash it. Got to squash it. President of the panel, Mama, she just said, leave it alone. And I was having fun with it. But, you know, Mama said, hey, leave it alone. I got to leave it alone. You don't question your mother. The yeah. man that questions his mother, not a true man. Why did she get involved in that? Is it, did because, it hit, because JaVel McGee? No, nah, I ain't got nothing to do with that. My mother is a 1,000% corporate. And she became that way. Well, she's always been that way. But she tells a story that. She had me at a young age. She sacrificed a lot. But because she invested her time in me, it's paying back. Her ROI, is, it, it, it hit. It's like Google. <laughs> yeah, the IPO it hit. So, has yeah, hit. It has hit. So it enabled her to go back to school and get her bachelor's, her master's, and her doctorate. So my mother is, is a sharp corporate businesswoman, and she knows it's just bad for business. Like me with my whole man ego thing, you say you want to fight. We going to fight. That's just how I am. And she's like, son, like, you know, she'll break it up. You got babies looking up to you, boom, boom, boom. And then it enables me to stop and, like, she's right, shut it down, boom, boom, boom. But, again, when you're a man and you're competitive and, you're, you know, people challenge you, like, like if you challenge me now, I'm going to just get like this and, and, I, and like, I'm going to be in challenge mode. So, But, you know, she called me and just had to let it go. Yeah, it seems like that's the one of the most powerful things around you is having other brains – Doing the thinking, as self-aware as you are, as, as willing and able as you are to manage your own emotions, having five other brains that go, well, hang on, let's take a breath here, is has been your saving grace for a long time. General Dwight Eisenhower said, the greatest leaders are the ones smart enough to hire people smarter than you around you. Best quote I've ever read in my life. 
If someone's listening to this right now and they think, I should do a panel, I should get my own panel, where do you recommend they start looking for that? Family and uh, friends and people that you trust. How do you know who you can trust if you already have a measure of success, right? Because those people then could have, an, not your family necessarily, but a lot of people around you will have an agenda by that point. Good point. And you just have to, I don't have a blueprint for it, just like a gut feeling thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing about Perry and my relationship is Perry was, didn't come looking for me. I found him. Uh, Uncle Mike and Uncle Jerome have been there since I've been a youngster. When I get caught stealing gum and the people call the cops, the cops are saying, hey, Uncle Jerome, Uncle Shad, we got your nephew again. We'll go get him. They come down. Instead of, you know, hit me with the book, they would explain, yo, man, you can't do this, boom, boom, boom. And my mother, you know, you got to love my mother. And Coach Brown was a guy that, that, that offered me a scholarship when I was the worst player on the Army base. He came in there and said, hey, I want to offer you a scholarship anyway because, you know, you're saying you're not a good player, and I know this Army life, your dad probably can't afford college. You can come to LSU anyway. So that's why I uh, decided to go to LSU, but that's why he's on the panel. So it's, it's, just, like a, it's just like a gut feeling. One, you can't have yes people. Like, they just got to tell you, you know, somebody you respect, they just got to tell you like it is. And the good thing for me is I don't know everything. And if I don't know, I'll ask a question and I can figure it out. But, you know, you have to be able to have someone that you love and respect be honest with you by keeping it real. Like when you do something wrong and they say you shouldn't have did that, you got to fix it. Like I'm not the guy, what? No, you, you shouldn't have did that. You shouldn't have said that. Boom, bam, bang. I'll talk to you later. And then, you know, I listen about, it, listen to it, think about it. And then we, we move on. Respect is the key word. Like Kobe, we had our ups and downs, but we always respected each other. Want to know? You want, want to know how I know we respected each other? In Game Seven, who did Kobe throw the lob to? Yeah, that was you. Okay, and uh, after the championship, in Indiana, who did Kobe run and jump into his arms? It must have been you. Uh, it must have been me. So <laughs> you know, after uh, after game in Indiana, when Kobe sprained his ankle and couldn't walk, who who said jump on my back and I walk you to the bus? Yeah, that was you. Exactly. So it's all the respect is there. Forget the little tits and the tads. You can have that. Up. Brothers have that. Yeah, true. Sisters have that. Married people have that. But as long as you got the respect there, it'll work. And that's what it's all about, especially when deciding your panel. When you got your check, when you first signed. It's you spent your first paycheck, I think, and was it forty five minutes or part of your first paycheck anyway? And it was my first minutes. paycheck. It was my first big check from Classic Cards. I did a card signing deal before I came in. It was a million dollars, and you know when you're a young kid and you have no no business etiquette or you don't know anything about business, a million is a million. But you know every every man that works and every man that has to pay a mortgage, you know that FICA, yeah, sales tax. States tax, you know, ink all like all those people are gonna get their money first before you see that. So my check was about seven fifty, and I didn't even know. Like I, my guy said, oh, "Hey, you signed for a million. and then I didn't even factor in his fifteen percent, which is one hundred fifty, and then boom and bam. So by the time I bought three cars, I bought a car, and my father said, "I want one." I was like, and in my mind, I was like, "Okay, one fifty minus a million. Oh, I got eight fifty left. Cool." <laughs> buy another one and then my mom said uh, hey I want one so I'm like okay 850 man. okay boom 700 yeah let's do it boom and then I got a call from the bank guy the next day he said you're 30,000 holes I bought rims and suits and baggy pants and Versace shirts and <laughs> chains and it was wild that's so when my father came in very and said see see let's go you need to get a business manager and then that's when I started looking for people the lesson to take away from that is, one, get a business manager, and two, don't go to the car dealership with your parents. No, just <laughs> – no, they just have to be smart. Like, I wish I'd, uh, I, I wish I would have knew about uh, leasing back then. I probably would have just leased the thing. Yeah? Yeah, rather than just been – I, I, I could have just put, like, 5000 down and paid, you know, 700 a month for, for three years rather than just give – Write a guy a check for 153 times. Expensive lessons, yeah, man. Expensive is, lessons, check. Yeah. What did you do before you had dough, though? I mean, in college, you must have had to sleep sideways on beds or stack beds together. I mean, what was that I like? I tried to get all the free stuff. And when I mean free stuff from LSU, I could. So I had about 20, 30 basketball Reebok sweatsuits. 
That's all I wore. Just track suits. Track suits and t- LSU football shirt, LSU t-shirt. And then I got a Pell Grant. So the Pell Grant, I got like $1,500. So I oh, go, yeah. So I go to the bank and I put $300, $100 bills, three, $300, three $100 bills, and the rest in one. So I like walk on campus like I had a big lot of money. <laughs> Just just to feel like, all right, I still yeah, got something yep, in my pocket, yep, huh? Yep. Nice. Nice. Just to feel rich. I, I guess that makes sense. I guess that makes sense to make sure you got something to show for it. Why the rap career being in movies, you know, it's I mean, you went platinum, so not bad, but what was the value add there? What's the for point? For me, it wasn't about doing those things, it was about following my dream. I'm in a studio with notorious B. I. G. Yeah. How many people can say that? Not not many. I'm in a studio with Jay Z. Nas, Peter Guns, Lord Tariq, Eric Sermon, Wu Tang Clan, real like those are the guys that I grew up listening to. Tribe Called Quest. I'm that's making it. Forget hot sounds and boom and bam and sell albums. Because like like I told a rapper this one uh, this one time, rap money is nothing to me. It's nothing. Like you can sell a mean album, two mean albums. You ain't you ain't getting a lot of that back. You know, you got to recoup, and you, like a lot of people don't understand that. You know, so for me, it was just fun. And then the movie thing is, it's all about opportunity. I I got blue chips from sitting in Jerry's Deli. The guy that wrote uh, White Man Can't Jump was coming up with a script, blue chips, and he saw me, and he's like, "Hey, you Shaq O'Neal, right? Boom, boom, boom. I'm doing a movie. Would you like to be in it? What you think I'm gonna say? No, no, I got to concentrate on my basketball. Forget that. I'm a yeah, I do it. That's my and it was and. I had to play me. It was one of my better movies. And then, you know, out here meeting people and shaking hands. Like, we get offered stuff all the time that we have to turn down. But yeah. it's all about opportunity. It's, and so you seize on those opportunities. As yeah. soon as you smell a good one, there's no hesitation. Yeah. And then, you know, it's all about having fun. It's not like we're out there like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, hey, we want you to do this. Mm, that, that seems cool. Let's do it. I think the the rap money doesn't mean anything to me. Is something that only a professional basketball yeah, player can I mean, say. I was making twenty, thirty million a year from basketball. Yeah, and then another ten, fifteen from Pepsi and Reebok, and you know another from the, the Shaq. Like we were, like I could have sold two, three million albums and got three million back. That's nothing. Yeah, that's a, in a way that's the most hip hop thing you could possibly yeah, say, like, right? <laughs> like, like you know, this ain't enough money for me. Like when you're talking about Shaq money, but. You know, to be able to tell your kids or to have people know that you were friends with Notorious B.I.G. and did a song with Jay-Z, that's that's classic. Yeah, right you there. got the legendary and, status. And because, because again, and you know, the thing is, if those people didn't, didn't like what I was doing, they probably would have said no. Sure. But they knew that, they, they knew that you know, we all, because we all come from the same place. We all from the inner city. So my, on the way to the, the to the court, I got my Kang all on. I got my fake rope chain on. I'm, I'm LL Cool J. As soon as I get there, I open my bag, I pull out my Chuck Taylors, and I'm Dr. J. So, you know, so like when I call all these people up, who a lot of them didn't charge me, by the way, it's like, yeah, man, we, we would love to do it. And they saw my passion and they saw that I really respected the craft. It was okay. Is there anything else on your bucket list, list that you haven't ticked off yet? Any plans to do anything? Yeah, we actually talked about it today. I have a dangerous bucket list that. If it don't go right, you you could probably never hear from me again. Uh, I, and I'm and I'm only let 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 the world know about two of those things. I would like to skydive, and I would like to have I would build a contraption that could survive Ni- Niagara Falls. I would. Yeah. I, what does the panel think about that one? They don't like it, but I, <laughs> I, but I want to do that. I mean, because I'm I like to have fun. I think I think if we design in a certain way, especially to where if I bounce around, nothing to hurt. Sure. And it, and it has to be strong enough to withstand in case it hit a rock or something. But I would like to do that, and then put cameras in there, let people tune in and see if I make it or not. Could stream it live, man. Yeah, yeah. I, could, yeah. Either way, it'll be a good show. And that's then I want to sure. I want to climb the Himalayas. I, I hear that's tough. Oh yeah, yeah. I hear that's very, very tough. So I, I want to do that. When I would bear grills, and that was tough. So yeah, I, I have a lot of things to do on my bucket list. <laughs> no MMA anymore, huh? Nah, nah. If because I, I know that you and Char- Charles Barkley were both kind of into that at one point. If I fought the NBA, MMA would it would only be one guy who would fight. Who'd you fight? His name is Hung Man Choi. He's a seven foot four guy from South Korea, I think. 
Wow. Yeah. So, Seven never, for four. I never fought any guy. Never fought. Never fought anybody in my size. I, I would. I would like to see how I would fare out. Yeah. Against that, That'd you could call Yao to too. Know. He might do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yao don't want these problems. <laughs> All right. Right on. Well, so I love that. And you're not going to wrestle the big show. Uh, probably not. Nah. Doesn't yeah. seem like a good use of uh, probably not. Your, sp- your lower back. Yeah. Either. <laughs> Yeah, I got to ask, or people are going to get mad as we wrap up here. What's what's going on with the flat earth thing? Are you t- are you just messing with everybody with that? No, the earth is no. flat. Would you like to hear my theory? Yeah, sure. tell me about it. The first part of the theory is, is I'm joking, you idiots. That's the first part of the theory. <laughs> <laughs> the second part is I said jokingly that when I'm in my bus and I drive from Florida to California, which I do every summer, it seems to be flat. When I'm in my plane and we're getting ready to land and I open up the window and I'm looking at all the land that we flower, it seems to be flat. But this world we live in, people take things too seriously. But I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the people answers to my tests. Knowing that I'm a funny guy, if something seems controversial or boom, 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 you got to add my funny points on, right? So now once you add my funny points on, that should eradicate and get rid of all your negative thoughts, right? That's what you should do when you hear a Shaquille O'Neal statement, okay? You should know that he has funny points right over here. And what did he say? The guy had boom, 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 boom. Add the funny points. You either laugh or you don't laugh. But don't take me seriously because when I want you to take me seriously, you will know by the tone of my voice that I'm being serious. So we live in a world today, and Denzel Washington said it best. There's too much information right now. There's too much going on. So, like, if, you know, somebody says something and, you know, they tire it and they send it out, by the time it gets to, to another guy, another guy, it's all messed up. So people actually really believe that I was serious when I said that. We, we, yeah. we actually had, no, we, we actually had people call in the office a long time. The Shaq really, no, I don't think that it was a joke. Okay, so know that when Shaquille O'Neal says something, 80% of the time, because 80% of the time I'm being humorous, it is a joke. And 20% of the time I'm being serious. But when I'm being serious, you'll know. You want to see me seriously? See me and Charles Barkley going back and forth on TNT. That's when I'm mad and when I'm serious. Other than that, you, you're not going to get that out of me. So I was just joking, people. The earth is not round. It's flat. I mean, <laughs> the earth is not flat. It's round. <laughs> Shaq, thank you so thank much, you, man. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate this it. This has been awesome. All right. Thank you.